So, hi, I want to continue with uh, what we were doing last time, which was the project of reading back who we are from the determinacies of uh, how our world is material reali materially realized. Um, remembering that we're talking about the things of our world not as neutral objects but as uh, things that appear to us and so we distinguished you know the plane for the carpenter from the plane from the child from the plane for the person who wants to stop the door um, the, uh, to, a, to an indifferent observer those all look like the same thing but those different people in a significant way see different things um, I say see uh, we broadly use that word see to mean um, meaningfully encounter or something like that um, but anyway um, so I wanted to, to continue with that uh, uh, with this idea that we can we can um, see who we are by reading back from the material specificities of our world right, how the world appears to us right and that was the point the reading again just to reiterate this thing from page 20 of sites of exposure the ongoing fact of my experience only is the experience of all the many determinacies that constitute the world beyond me, uh, such that, on page 31, uh, the thing will not be understood when it's taken in its in abstraction from its role in articulating the life, the life of a person, the lives of a person. And that's then the same point as Heidegger, uh, Dasein, is it's there, right? That, uh, you, your experience, your perspective is enacted in the way you take up a world, and we can read back then from that world uh, to see who you are. Uh, so last time uh, I was uh, doing that by you know talking a little bit about the um, tools of the carpenter guy in the right panel of the marrow at altarpiece, um, and. Uh, here, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that his table actually isn't as high as the table I said because he's sitting down. But anyway, the, the point was, uh, what I was trying to get at very quickly is um, those tools speak to his individual competence. They speak to the uniqueness of his bodily situation, how tall he is, whether he's... Uh, uh, got both his legs, both his arms, that kind of thing, um, to his intelligence, uh, to his unique learning, um, his know-how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's, that's, what's, that's what's addressed through those tools, basically. Um, so I wanted to compare that with a different thing. And th this is a, a, a painting by uh, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec from 1890. It's a portrait of a uh, bassoonist and composer Desiree Dial. Um, but it's just a picture of him sitting in the garden reading a newspaper. And uh, I wanted you to think about the difference between the newspaper as roughly a piece of equipment and uh, you know the the plane or or what you know, I don't even know I don't even know the names of serious carpenters tools, uh, which shows that those are the tools of a specialist. But whatever those things are, whatever kind of um, file or plane or I don't, know, I don't even know what else you would have, an awl or something, I don't know. But you think of those those things, uh, a world for which those are the relevant um, pieces of equipment in that whole network of equipment that allows him to carry out his identity as a carpenter. What, what kind of tool, in that sense of tool, what kind of tool is a newspaper? Um, uh, the 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 tool I was you know I was saying speaks to the individuality and the skill and all the rest of that of the carpenter. Uh, so I'd like you to try to read back from the newspaper and think about what it speaks to. Um, let be, I'm going to say something about that in a minute. For the moment, I just for the moment I just want you to think about it, and I'll come back and say something about it. But first, I just want to draw your attention to something else, uh, and that is that you know if we go back to uh, uh, our carpenter again. 
again, it's it's too bad that this isn't a point of view shot. Like this is us looking on at him. So, and really, what we want is the tools as they appear to him. In the, that sense of appearing I gave before, where appearing is uh, them disappearing in a certain sense, but being at the ready as a whole vibrant living network of resources for him to fulfill his tasks and so on. Um, well, that's what we really want is something that portrays it more from his perspective rather than this, which is the perspective of someone else looking on. Um, but but I, I'm put, I'll, put the, uh, I'll have you look at the image again anyway, just so that you can sort of keep this in mind. Like, um, yeah, these things speak to him as a capable individual who's working on things. But, you know, if you think about it, um, other people are implied in those things too in a few ways. You know, it's quite possible he's making something for himself, but there's a very good chance that he's making something for someone else. So he may he may be making a um, a beautiful table, let's say, uh, for some relatively rich person who's paying for it. He may be making a coffin. I don't know. Um, but but the but in the very thing he's engaging with as his objective, his goal, he's also engaging with another person because he's doing it. You know for that person so in the very meaning of the thing he's working on is the meaning of another person which means another dasein right it means another being like you or me who has a perspective who is thrown into the world another being who is his or her or their da um who is his there his his or her or their there <laughs> um and you know even in the tools that the that he has they're not exactly f um ultimately for someone else in that same way but they probably come from someone else he's a carpenter but he's probably not a tool maker so you know there's a some kind of sharp knife looking thing there i mean all those things are metal so there must be a blacksmith involved in there somewhere and, and various other things um so um both at the at both ends like where his tools come from and where his work is going Someone else is on the horizon of his perspective, uh, perspective. Someone else is already implied in the very things he's doing. So in, in, a, in a significant way, the um, carpenter is dealing with other people all the time when he's working. Not in the sense that there's another person in the room talking with him, but the reality he's playing with and the reality he's moving around is a real reality defined by the fact of other people. Right? Uh, so, so I want I want to say that that's um, that's going to be true no matter what. You know, we're 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 always in the world uh, with other people already there. You know, you don't. Um, uh, the point about being in the world or about design is that you don't start off in a little box some there somewhere and then one day decide you're going to go have experience of the world. No, you only exist as the experiencing of, the, of a world. It was never otherwise. So the world or reality isn't something that might or might not be there. Right? It's, it's not an optional thing that you discover or learn about, but, but you used to be doing other things or you could do something else. No, your reality just is to be... In the, in the words of the title of the book, you're ex it's something you're exposed to. Your very, your very reality is such that you are always, you are already exposed to reality. You are always already in the world. Similarly with other people. Other people are not things that you might or might not uh, have in your world. You, you, you are in a world where others are already there. So you learn in you know in pretty rich ways what other people amount to like you learn how to deal with them you learn what comes from them what possibilities there are with them and so on but the fact that there are other people you don't learn that you 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 come equipped with that right it, which is to say you are the kind of being who is already open to recognizing the existence of others in the world the world that you start off encountering is one in which the meaning there is another person is is already written into it right? so for that reason the the things we are doing are always uh, going to be ways of engaging with other people because that's just there that's just part of what uh, reality is um, um, 
So we were looking at the the um, carpenter's tools and thinking about the, the the way other people are on the horizon of those things. I wanted to go back now and look at the newspaper in the Toulouse Lautrec painting and think a little bit about about that, about how other people are there. So it seems to me there, there's an, in, an interesting thing here. Uh, the, I was saying, you know, what's it like if the a newspaper is part of your equipment? And f probably for many of you it is. If, it may be not necessarily in the sense of that piece of paper, but probably there are blogs you read or, you know, things or new so-called news feeds uh, on whatever, Facebook or something like that. Um, uh, uh, the, the newspaper for a lot of people surely is part of their equipment in, in the sense that it's a big part of how their world is articulated. They won't feel that um, comfortable in the morning if they don't, you know, uh, get to have their newspaper just like they have their cup of coffee or, um, you know, whatever else, sit down at the coffee shop or sit down at the breakfast table or, or whatever, have their, have your English muffin with raspberry jam or whatever you like to have for breakfast. Um, uh, the newspaper is part of the way you get into the day. And, uh, but it's interesting because it's a way you get into the day that, you know, is also is got these things that tell you about what's going on in uh, Afghanistan and Hong Kong and uh, Texas, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting way. It gets you into the day in a very rich sense that it kind of gets you into your world in quite a big sense. It, 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 it does a lot of the work of making a world appear to you. Right? It does a lot of work in shaping how reality appears to you right so it's it's actually it actually plays a pretty big role for for most of us i think in uh defining how we inhabit our world or another way of saying that is defining the world we inhabit um but yeah but let's but let's just let's just think about the the newspaper and um in comparison with or in contrast with uh the carpenter's tools here you're addressed by the newspaper like you're addressed by the tools, but the but the newspaper is pointedly generic. The same newspaper goes to you as to everybody else, and the newspaper is obviously speaking its language, right? the 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 little carpenter's saw or whatever is not in any obvious sense language. It's a saw, but newspaper's language, and the and language is is a kind of reality, the unique and exclusive reality of which. Is that it's 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 about speaking to people, right? So the the if you think of the um, server and the uh, Manet painting, uh, or the painter in the Velázquez painting, or the ladies in waiting, you know they're addressing you, and that's one of the reasons those paintings that we looked at at first are so gripping, because they're they're saying, hey, by the way, we see you there, you know, uh, we're talking to you, um, with, and those are paintings, so the you know. The, the, new, the newspaper does that in words, like they're words written for a perspective that can read and understand and think about things, right? It's language. So the newspapers are for language users, and they're, they're for the communication of ideas and imaginations and whatever else to people, to individual readers. So the newspaper, in a really powerful way, addresses you as something like Dasein, like it addresses you as a, a thinking, a speaking person who wants to know about things and who needs to be involved in the world. But it does it totally generically. Right? You can read it and anybody else can read it. And, you know, the, this newspaper is printed and it, when we're speaking of print newspapers, as, as in that Toulouse or Trek painting, uh, not so much with the internet blogs, but in the days when things were printed on paper, you know, the newspaper would print up its, the newspaper company would print up its however many thousand copies, and those things would go to wherever they're going to go. And uh, every reader would read that same thing. And that's it's part of the appeal of it, too, is you know that what you're reading is what everybody else is reading. So you're, you're all getting the same story. That's part of how you were able then to communicate with people and so on. Um, there's, a, there's quite an interesting book by Benedict Anderson called Imagined Communities. And uh, he's talking about the significance of um, printing press and uh, writing and the development of, of easily um, reproducible and transportable, transmittable writing. 
And he makes a very interesting point that um, the printing press is a big part of what enabled the coming into being of the modern sense of the nation state because it allowed people from um, different parts of a, of a geographical region uh, who couldn't actually speak to each other because they spoke quite different dialects to come to interpret themselves as part of the same community, the same nation, because they could all read the same written things. So I think I think the, partic- the specific example he gives initially, I think, is France. But you can imagine people in the south, Languedoc or something like that. Um, they don't sound like the people in Brittany in the north um, west. Um, but they could all read the written script that we call French in some version of it. Uh, so if you print print something in that, you can give it to the people in Brittany and the people in Languedoc, and they can all they can all read it, and they can all read the same thing, and they can, in that sense, say, "Oh, we all have the same language," which is not an experience they so easily would have had in encountering one another. Um, in fact, there's some pretty interesting and and bloody history attached to that exact issue. Um, but so the interesting thing there was that by print, this, this generation of this printed medium, uh, people could come to think of themselves as part of the same nation. And so uh, Benedict Anderson is, is part of a, a bigger story about, how, about nation states and so on. But that's, part, that's a big part of uh, a kind of material reality that made it possible for the modern conception of the nation, the, what we think of as a country nowadays, to, to come into being. Um, well, uh, anyway, so I just, you know, the thing about the newspaper is everybody reads it, and because we're all reading the same thing, there's a sense in which we all have the same view about what's happening in the world. Um, from the, f- and, and the newspaper, it does have that form of address. It's telling you things, right? So it's like we've all been told, here's what's happening. And that means here are, here are the things that you should notice. Here are the stories worth telling. Right? What's the New York, is it the New York Times? They say all the news that's fit to print. Fit to print. It's a pretty striking claim. Uh, it's a ridiculous claim, but it's a pretty striking one. Uh, that's the same as saying if it's not in here, it's not important. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty. It's a pretty pretty big claim for a newspaper. I think there's a lot of things left out of the New York Times. Um, but but in any case, that that is kind of the attitude of the newspaper. It's like we, whoever we is, who wrote that thing. But there's the sort of a authoritative voice says we investigated things and we know what's happening we know the stories that are worth telling and we're going to tell you the important things about them so that you will know the important things that are happening in the world and you know people read the newspaper and they feel like they're informed they feel like now they know what's going on in the world um so if you think of it in that way you know the the newspaper is um basically manufacturing a very generic kind of public opinion. And insofar as you and the newspaper match up, you know, insofar as it's part of your equipment, insofar as it's an arti- part of the articulation of your perspective, um, your basic, who you are is basically an instance of that generic subject. Um, when, when, uh, excuse me. Um, when you when you then think with the newspaper's perspective, which is to say, probably the way you think most of the time, when you say, "Oh, I hear that Trump is doing this," or um, you know what we really should do about uh, testing sites for COVID nineteen, right? You talk about these things that you know you'd never even heard about a small number of months before. But you read about it in the newspaper and you start to feel like, oh, I know about that. And you talk about it and you have opinions about these things that you've never heard of and you've never studied. You have strong opinions um, because the, these things have been fed to you in various ways. Um, uh, and so when you, when, you ad- when you, as most of us do, when you start to adopt your way of thinking about things from the newspaper, you think... Not you don't think exactly as you think in the sense that you didn't go out and do a lot of work to study and learn about things and carve out your own perspective on how you're going to take things up. You didn't do that. You let 
the newspaper do a bunch of work for you and hand you some stuff, and you adopted the thing they handed you. And so you think, not exactly as you think, you think as one thinks. You think as basically anyone who reads that newspaper thinks. You, you think the way one thinks. Or you might think, oh, I think the way we think, you know. Um, and anybody else who does the same thing also thinks the way one thinks. It's, it's a kind of a very non-personal way of thinking from the perspective that everyone adopts. And the validation of it mostly is the fact that, well, that's how everybody thinks. Right? Um, so I said, you know, I was saying, oh, you know, you could say, well, that's how we think. But it's not exactly we, because when you really use the word we, um, it, if, it, if it's got a strong sense, it really has to do with you having formed a real bond with someone. We do this thing together. The thing about the newspaper is you have no connection with those other people who read it. Like in the example I gave from Benedict Anderson, the people from Languedoc and Brittany, like they sure weren't a we. They were um, uh, quite different uh, populations who uh, had a lot to be opposed about and so on. Um, and yet they could then say, oh, French, that's the language we speak. <laughs> and suddenly, in a sense, they became a we. They became the French nation state. Um, but so you see, in a sense, the emptiness of that we. It's it's not the we of real sharedness of perspective, right? It's not that. Uh, it's, it's, it's the we of a bond you formed with other people you don't even know about and you don't actually really care about. But the, the very things that make those other people specific and that might very well make them people you therefore don't like, that's the, that's the, the, the very thing that would make those people specific and in, a, and in a rich sense who they are is what you're ignoring. And the way you're bonding with them is with respect to the way that they are defined by that same thing you're defined by, namely the newspaper. Right? That newspaper becomes the substance of the we. Right? Um, so the way they Macquarie and Robinson so well Heidegger refers to that as the one das man uh, you you think as one thinks um, uh, Macquarie and Robinson translated as the they um, and and I mean from the point of view of the languages that's not a great translation from the point of view of English idiom it's not bad because uh, we often find ourselves doing things where we're talking about let's say uh, let's say COVID-19 and someone says, oh, well, they say it's, uh, they say it's not airborne or they say it's airborne, right? Or they say the Canadian face masks kill the virus, you know? Um, that expression we have, they say. Uh, so you hear people use it a lot. Maybe you've used it. Uh, it's a pretty common expression. It's the way we refer to this non-identifiable, uh, putatively authoritative speaking subject um, uh, the one that's that really has the reasons behind all those things we believe we don't know what those reasons are but but oh yeah they but they say it they 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 proved they've proved that so and such is the case right uh, any real proof any real saying is always done by a person you can always say who did it you can say this person proved this thing by this means this person said this thing right if 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 you're actually ever really interested in that kind of accountability, you have to trace it back to actual agents. But we don't do that. We just say they say. And, and in doing that, we both um, justify ourselves in believing it and uh, exempt ourselves from the responsibility of ever coming up with a good account. We sort of say, oh, it's been taken care of elsewhere. Right? Uh, so... So that English idiom of they say uh, is actually a pretty good translation of, of das man, not because the word in English corresponds to the word in German, that it doesn't, but because that English idiom of, well, they say that's the way it is. They say there's a cure. You know, They say everything happens for a reason. That idiom uh, captures well the point Heidegger is trying to make when he says, you know, you act as das man acts. You act as one acts. Right? Um, uh, so I was talking about things. Um, uh, the, the things of the world and how they appear to us. Uh, and I'm, t I'm, I'm asking who... I'm trying to do that thing of reading back to who we are from the things that articulate our world. And I'm asking who are we if 
the newspaper is part of our equipment. Um, so again, that's not the newspaper as an uh, object made out of paper and ink that you could photograph and weigh. Uh, it's not an indifferent thing present at hand in the world. I'm talking about the equipment, uh, sorry, the newspaper as, as a functional part of your experience, as, as something you or one, someone relates to as um, an engaging uh, source of orientation to the world that you depend upon. I'm talking about, I'm asking, what is, what, who, what can we say about you when a newspaper appears to you that way? When, when that piece of paper with ink on it appears to you as this compelling insight into how to orient yourself towards the world. And, and there, uh, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, you know, that, that the subject who relies on the newspaper is sort of, well, is quite significantly different from the subject who relies on the, the file or whatever the carpenter had to grab to fix this little piece of the thing he or she or they is making. Um, uh, the subject for whom the newspaper is appearing in that way is, uh, is that generic subject. It's, it's the they, it's the, the one. Um, so that's what I'd like you to think about. I, you know what? We could do other ones too. We could look at the handheld computer uh, that people like to call a smartphone, um, uh, even though it's not smart. And generally speaking, you don't use it as a phone. Um, but um, we could talk about that. Uh, we could talk about ooh, we could talk about the uh, uh, any other kind of computer that's attached to the internet. Um, uh, we can talk about um, we can talk about money, dollar bills uh, in your pocket uh, when those are when those are the equipment of your world. Uh, we can talk about let's get another one. Bank card. It's kind of like dollar bills. Uh, health card, uh, various others, driver's license. You know, we could pull out some more. But you could think about what, what some of the equipment is in your world. And, and those ones I've just pulled out uh, are all kind of different from the that uh, whatever the little handheld tool of the carpenter is. Um, so I'm not going to pursue that uh, farther right now. I really wanted just to, to explore the whatever, the file, handheld file versus the newspaper. Uh, just to just get you to think a, a bit about that, both the general way that who you are is implied in the things of your world, but also in, in the specific way that there, there's a particular kind of who that is implied by things like the newspaper. And, and also in both cases, remember I was talking about how the who of you all also always has other people on the horizon. And so the the relationship between the you of the carpenter, the, the or the I of the carpenter, who the carpenter is, the who of the carpenter, and the other who's that carpenter has in his or her or their world, whoops, excuse me, is uh, I think significantly different again from the way that the who of the person who relies on the newspaper is related to all those other who's who read the newspaper. Right? So both as a, so we're seeing two linked things. Who you are and who other people are are two versions of the same issue. And that paired issue of the who of you and others um, is being worked out quite differently in a world articulated through the handheld, uh, I wish I knew the names of some carpenter's tools, the handheld uh, file, I go back to that one, or the plane. Uh, or hammer, he had a hammer in that picture, uh, or the world that's articulated through the newspaper, also handheld in the case of the Toulouse-Lautrec portrait, um, but uh, uh, works just as well with your internet blog and so on. Anyway, so I want you to think about those things. We'll, we'll stop this here, and then when I come back, we'll, we'll have the third little lecture to wrap up this little segment, which is basically about Division 1, Chapter 4 of Being in Time, which is uh, essentially about the who of Dasein. And I'll come back and I'll look at 
uh, some of the specific texts there in Heidegger's Being and Time. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs>